is Derek Staley with ESFI World here at IPL4 in Las Vegas, Nevada, and I'm joined by Kevin Kaspersamich-Naki. So thank you very much for sitting down with us, Kevin. No problem. How's it going, man? It's going good. Uh, so you know, before we get into the event, a lot of people don't really know how you got involved with uh, IPL. So can you talk about your history with StarCraft II commentating and how you ended up with IGN? Yeah, absolutely. So back around launch of StarCraft II, I wasn't very involved in the beta. I mean, I watched some of the videos and tournaments and stuff like that, but I wasn't involved in the beta myself. I bought the game at launch. Uh, I played a lot, then I played a lot, a lot, then I played a lot, a lot, a lot. I was playing like 30 hours a week or something like that. And um, eventually, uh, this on top of trying to be a full-time grad student and holding a research assistantship and being married. Um, so I was playing a lot of StarCraft. It was a lot of my free time. And of course, playing a lot led me to Team Liquid. Team Liquid led me to streams. Streams led me to tournaments. And eventually, I started watching more StarCraft than I was playing. This went for about a month or so until about October, I think, of 2010. And I decided to fire up a stream. I grabbed some replays, and I started broadcasting to about two people a night. And uh, two people became five, five became 20, 20 became 100, and uh, eventually I started to be asked to do little tournaments and things like that, uh, online cups and the sort. I was doing the, uh, um, oh man, I, I can't even think of the name now. What was the precursor to the Playhem Daily? The, oh. the, the one that was always around that was every day. Ah, that's going to make so, for a Zotac? terrible interview question. Not, not Zotac, Zotac, I but what it was. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> What's... The, I did a bunch of the Zeke tournaments, but um, but there was another one that was every day. And so I, I, so I was doing a bunch of those. Um, eventually, I got hooked up with r slash StarCraft, and I started doing the r slash StarCraft Opens, um, which were really cool. That was a big breakthrough for me. And eventually, I was casting enough that I was neglecting my grad school studies. And uh, I was starting to attract between 500 to 700 viewers a night, something like that. And I was starting to think, well, OK, well, if I ran commercials at this point, I could actually make minimum wage. Maybe I could try and do this and cast for a living. So I decided to fund a trip down to MLG Dallas in 2011. And uh, it was almost exactly one year ago from today. And I, uh, so I get down there. And fortunately for me, but unfortunately for the crowd at MLG, they shut off the caster noise. And uh, that was because this was pre-isolation booths and the players could hear the commentary. So they cut it off and I ended up uh, sitting next to David Ting. I had been uh, talking to him a couple of times throughout the event, and uh, he wanted to chat with me a little bit further. So we sat down in the front row during Idra versus Kiwikaki, and I essentially personally commentated the matches to him for a couple of hours. A few days later, he sent me an email saying that he wanted me to uh, pitch in on IPL2. This was actually pre-IPL1. And uh, a couple weeks later, they had a problem getting some casts from a couple of the casters, so they asked me to step in. I delivered them that afternoon. The next day, they gave me a job in San Francisco. So that's uh, kind of how I start, got started at IPL. Uh, you evolved pretty quickly there. Um, and you know, you're relatively new to the scene compared to a lot of the other mm -hmm. commentators out there, guys like you know, DJ Weed have been around forever, pretty much. Um, and right now, it's actually, it seems like it's harder than ever for new commentators to get into the scene right now. Um, what do you think we can do to help promote new talent in StarCraft II commentating? You know, it is and it isn't uh, difficult for new talent to get in. I, I think that there are certain parts of the market that are severely oversaturated. I think that StarCraft II commentary on YouTube, for example, is, is pointlessly oversaturated. For you to honestly try and go out, you either have to have a huge hook or there's just no point for you to try and do it. You're just not going to get the subscribers. And I'm not trying to be doom and gloom. It's just not going to happen. You have to look for other avenues of way to make a breakthrough. But we've seen other casters like Kolaris and things like that step up for um, now ESL and things along those lines. So people are starting to get breakthroughs, Frodan even coming down from uh, Northern California to start with NASL. Um, so it's not impossible, but it requires an immense amount of dedication and really kind of a foolish decision to chuck everything else in your life aside, which is what I did to try and pursue it. So um, my best advice to try and recognize new talent is the big guys out there. You know, make sure that um, most people are very, very amazing. In, in the StarCraft community. I, I've had nothing but support from guys like Day9, Total Biscuit even got me my start, Artosa I've talked to a few times, he's an amazing person. But uh, we can't have like an old boys club mentality about it. We're trying not to capitalize and monetize 200,000 viewers, we're trying to bring this to 200 million people. And in order to do that, we need to be constantly co-promoting each other and things like that, trying to get new talent out there. And I think, so a lot of that is on the established personalities, but uh, part of that, you just need an immense amount of dedication. Is that something you like to see the organizations involved in, or do you think it's really just falls on the other casters and the other people in the community to do? Organizations find new talent as it kind of comes to them, but I mean, it's very difficult to kind of just sit there and go, okay, well, we're specifically going to go out and hire new talent for, you know, X, Y, and Z reasons. Yes, if they have an impressive enough re resume, you can take a chance on them, but otherwise, it is a little bit safer to go with established personalities right now. It's just going to take that promotion, I think, from uh, uh, grassroots. Uh, Reddit's the best place to get a lot of attention and stuff like that. You can put your cast up there. Uh, um, I, obviously, Twitch TV, own 3D, things like that. Great opportunities to try and get some attention there. But you kind of just got to have your hook, dedication, and make sure you're casting every night. That's the easiest way to do it. 
All right, moving on to uh, your job now with IPO. Mm -hmm. uh, outside of commentating, what is actually your day-to-day -day job? What do you consist of at IPO? Well, um, for the first like seven months I was with IPL, or a little bit less than I think, like six months I was with IPL, um, I kind of filled in on whatever needed to be done. Like at first I became like a VOD factory. I, um, I, I produced like 300 VODs over two months or something like that. It's something just obnoxiously insane. That's all I did was producing VODs in addition to casting. Um, recently though, I've been moved up to, I, I'm the marketing manager and talent manager of IPL as well. So I get to handle a lot of like the day-to-day -day communications and plans uh, regarding our clients and stuff. So I'm doing a a lot of the back-end business things as well and I'm really enjoying it I, I never want to discard casting and I and that's always going to be my priority but I, I really feel like I'm making a mark and I can actually have my impact felt on esports uh, being involved in kind of the business side of the league as well so IPL4, uh, we're here in Vegas, as I said. It's been hectic, to say the least. Yep. Uh, what are your thoughts on the event so far? Um, the event has been very good so far. Um, there's been some very obvious problems that we're going to need to uh, work through when we get back, and uh, rest assured, we will be taking care of those. Um, but overall, the games have been spectacular. The players, I mean, we couldn't imagine anyone else. As as this interview sits, so this will date the interview, Stefano is still you know top four in the winner's bracket of the championship bracket, so we still have a foreigner hope. We have players like MMA, MKP, Nesty that are still competing as well. So, I mean, as far is I mean so I, I guess there's not a ton of like stories of someone who bounced out of lower bracket it was amazing it was Scarlet got very close obviously we had the foreigner hopes uh, illusion huck and Sase were kind of dashed the last second but it's still an incredibly competitive pool and it's it's gonna be amazing so yeah I'm, I'm pretty happy with the games themselves you mentioned the issues uh, I mean the live event has been rather smooth but when you actually look at the online stream of things there's been sound issues technical mm -hmm. issues when you guys go back home uh, you know and you kind of rally everybody together what do you really look at as far as how do you like kind of target the areas you need to improve Everything. I mean, I mean, it's it's pretty comprehensive. Our post mortem process. We of course have our own internal notes and things that people on stream haven't seen of things we need to improve and stuff like that. Um, but a lot of it comes from the community as well. After IPL3, we put out a huge post on Team Liquid and Reddit that said, "Please give us all your feedback, positive and negative." We take that stuff very seriously, and we try very hard not to gloss over the details. So um, everything that that people have, uh, all information people have given us, uh, have been considered and in many cases implemented into our processes. So. You also got an opportunity to uh, MC the GSTO, which is uh, a little bit different than what you normally do. Yes. Uh, can you talk about how that was, and, and is that something you'd like to do in the future, or are you comfortable, more comfortable behind the casting desk? It was amazing. It was a dream come true, honestly. So um, I, I took that very seriously. I hope people you know, saw the preparation that was there. But I mean, like I, I studied how the Korean casters, dr the, the MCs specifically, I'm sorry, dressed, um, what their approach was, how they conducted themselves on stage, how they carried their the inflection in their voice. Uh, the English language is a little bit less elegant than Korean. So it, it's, it's more difficult to get that sort of pacing um, whenever you're doing the announcements. And generally, the English audience likes a little bit different, more boxing announcer style. But uh, I tried very hard to emulate, uh, you know, what's been seen on Korean broadcasts. So I hope it came through. It was a huge thrill for me, though. And uh, I, I would absolutely do it again if they called. So on a normal basis, you work with Eric uh, Doa on a, a regular basis in the studio. Mm -hmm. uh, this weekend, though, so with the absence of Total Biscuit, you've had to sort of rotate between different casting pairs. Uh, is it difficult to adjust to different partners that you haven't really worked with in the past, as opposed to working with somebody that you do pretty much every day uh, in the studio? Sometimes it is, sometimes it isn't. Um, I mean, I've had casters in the past that it's been difficult to adjust to. They have very conflicting styles, or whatever the case may be. Um, this weekend, though, I've casted with Pain User in the past, so that was no problem to step back into that. Uh, I've casted with Doa, of course, and, and we, we cast every night, and that's great. Um, Apollo has been remarkably easy to cast with. He is, he is I'm blown away by how professional this guy is. Um, I mean, seriously, more people need to pay attention to him. He has been an absolute nerd baller. It's been amazing casting with him. I, I think for this being the first time we've ever casted together, um, I'm pretty happy with um, both the way that we have interacted with each other and the way the community's received it. It seems like it's been pretty positive so far. So working for IPL, uh, you are pretty much locked into casting the IPL events, as you said, with your as uh, kind of linking back to your normal casting partners. Uh, you have other guys like DJ Wheat, like Day9, who travel all over the world. They cast different events, ESL, they cast IEM, DreamHack, et cetera. Um, is that something you kind of miss out on, and is that something you'd like to do eventually, or are you pretty content with just you know doing the IPL events? Well, it's not without the realm of possibility that I'll be casting other events and stuff like that at some point. But for now, um, I, I enjoy the stability. Um, I have to admit, it's it's very nice to know that I have a full week's worth of work. I'm not saying that other people haven't been able to do the freelance thing very very well, um, but that's not really for me. That's that's not kind of my personality or anything like that. The traveling's cool. I enjoy going to live events, of course, but I very much enjoy the day in day out getting involved in the business side of things and being able to, uh, you know, interact in, in a bigger portion with the league than just uh, being simply a caster, you know? 
All right, Kevin, thank you very much. Uh, any last words? Uh, no, I appreciate you guys very much for uh, tuning in this weekend. It's been a big pleasure casting for you guys, and uh, especially hope you enjoy the GSTL finals. I was, it was, I was pretty nervous for that, so I didn't know how the community was going to receive it, but it seems like it was pretty positive. Uh, other than that, uh, check us out, IGN.com slash IPL. And a uh, big shout-out to my wonderful wife, Catherine, so, for uh, supporting me. So thanks very much. All right, thanks.